you are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week would go a long way. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life. Good morning. I am glad to be back. I got to tell you, this once a month thing is working for me, Pastor Mitch. I, am, I look forward to coming. Love, love seeing you guys. I meet up with different people. I'm having the time of my life. It's great. So yeah, I have to admit, it's a lot colder here than California. Um, sometimes it makes you rethink your decisions when you're like, negative nine? What? <laughs> it's like if they get an inch of snow in Redding, like the whole city shuts down, and here we're sporting negative nine and six inches of snow, whatever. It's good to be here, snow and all. But anyway, um, yeah, I just wanted to share something I heard. I, I'm going to repeat a few things. If you were at the young adult meeting, which we have a young adult ministry, we meet once a month. I think the next time we're going to meet is probably February 25th. If, you, if you're out of high school and under 35, please come. I think we're building a really great community. Seems like God is doing some really cool things. But I shared with them, actually, I didn't share with them. I shared with a different group. Back that up. But still come to the young adult ministry if you can. Anyway, there was, I was listening to a worship leader. And you know, worship leaders, they say things and, and it's good. But this guy, he just made this super simple statement. And it just struck me. He said, Lean into the gospel as you're worshiping. Lean in. And I, you know, I'm sure I've heard that statement before. It's not a new earth-shaking statement. But I thought about Peter getting out of the boat. And there was a point when he had to shift his weight from the boat that was holding him onto something where he had no control where it was only God that could support his weight on the water. There was this, there was a shift, one second where he finally was like, okay. It reminds me, I don't know if you've ever been to Rock Run, which is north um, of like Liberty, Williamsport area, but I was with Josh Rios and some friends and we were gonna jump into this creek. Very big, very deep, it's safe, but I don't like heights. And so, I'm like, I can do this. <laughs> then my friends would jump, and I'm like, I can do this. I know I can do it. And then more people would jump, and I'd be like, I can't do this. <laughs> and then I would sit there, and I remember it was in my mind. I'm like, all you got to do is shift your weight. Just shift your weight, Jim. Shift it. Finally, I'm like, Duh. and I... It was in that one second where my weight went from where I was in control until I wasn't in control, and it worked, and I lived, and it was great, and I could say, I did it. With, I think faith is like that. There's this thing where there's a release where when we're in control and what we perceive, even if it's not necessarily good, it's still like, I, I am in control of what's going on, but faith says, Throw your weight and let God catch you. And so what I, what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about leaning into the gospel for your heart this morning. And, and it does require a shift of weight, a shift of who's in control. Is the gospel enough to call you righteous where you can approach God with confidence? Is the gospel enough to say that you're blessed and that guy said a minute ago, he is a good father who will take care of you? When things don't look that way, we have that, that decision to make. Will I cast myself onto the waters and let him hold me? Or will I hold back and try to figure this out myself? It's a lot more stressful when you have to figure it out. After you get over the initial jump, I think it was Charles Spurgeon that said the promises of God are like a couch that holds you up. You cast yourself upon it and rest. It's a much better way of living 
but there is a shift. Is this making sense? Am I making, please tell me I'm making sense. Make me feel better about myself. <laughs> All right. So as we go into this service, I want you to mentally and spiritually think about yourself casting yourself upon the goodness of God. Casting yourself upon the fact that he has so much more for you than you could possibly understand. He has so much more for you than you've ever perceived or has ever entered into your heart. It says he does above and beyond what we could ask, think, or imagine. What if we took that scripture as truth and we started living like that and we adopted a mentality of above and beyond what I could ask, think, or imagine? A victorious mindset, a hopeful mindset, an encouragement mindset. You know, it says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you adopt that, you're going to start living in righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom is going to start taking over because you are leaning into what Jesus has done and your faith says, I believe it and it's enough. Hallelujah. It's enough. He's enough. The cross was enough. The resurrection was enough for me to get above and beyond whatever I can ask, think, or imagine. And so... In, in, in studying for today, I really feel this prophetic prompting to tell you that there's more than what you see. What you are perceiving is not the end of the story, and it is not the limits of your life or your hope. And so, and I think that as we get into living out of living out of more than what we can perceive, it creates momentum and it creates a greater weight to our lives, if you will. And I'll explain it. I, I, sh I did share on Friday, I know for a fact, I shared the quote, and I cannot get this quote out of my mind. It said, sit at a table with warriors because the conversation's different. And I, I see two aspects of that. And one is, I think the more obvious one, sitting with people who are warriors, people who are further ahead than you, people who are better at things than you, people who when you sit with them, you feel stretched and you feel inspired and you feel encouraged. I have multiple friends like this. Just in a, in a normal conversation, I get off the phone and I'm like, oh, I just wanna run through a wall. You know, just inspire me. Like, dude, they're doing the stuff I want to do. Like, oh, man, it just, it's different than when you just sit with someone with no vision and no passion and no walk with God, and you're just like, did you see the game last night? Like, I love talking about football, but if that's the depth of our relationship, we, we don't have a whole lot going on. And so there's that aspect of sitting at a table with warriors, but... I think the thing that provokes me even more is when you sit at a table with warriors, eventually you become the warrior. Yes. And I believe the Lord is raising up a generation to be people who are weighty in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Not people who just come to church and leave, but people like the, the guys that showed up this morning to learn how to pray for the sick and prophesy and see the kingdom of God flow through their life so that when people sit with them, they're like, I just met with a man or a woman of God. There's something about your conversation. There's something about your presence. There's something about what you do and what you say that has the fingerprints of Jesus all over it. That's our destination. That's what Jesus died for. But if we only live in our own limitations and we only live by what we can see, we will be limited. And I, I, th I'm th I think about... All these different people in the Bible who Jesus or God in the Old Testament pulled out of, you think, normal situations and set them up for greatness. You have like Peter and John, they're fishermen. It says in Acts that they were known to be uneducated. They weren't smart. They're just fishermen, normal people doing their job. And Jesus pulls them up and says, you're fishers of men. And they start the church. They write the Bible. I mean, went from a fisherman to writing scripture, eternal word of God. You have Matthew, same thing. He's just a tax collector. Normal day, doing his job. 
actually hated by most people because his job was so terrible. And Jesus is like, come and follow me. Writes eternal scripture. You have Joseph. He's got all these promises on his life. Finds himself in prison for something he didn't do for, I believe, 13 years. Gets pulled out of the dungeon and he's second in command of all of Egypt. And his wisdom saves a nation and other nations. So as you're here today, you might be like, hey, I'm just a mechanic. I'm just a teacher. I'm just a professor. I'm just a mom. I'm just normal. Right, exactly. You're primed for greatness. You're primed because the great one lives with inside of you. Lives inside of you. And I think all of us, no matter where we are or how long we've been walking with God and what level we're on, I believe there is an invitation to step into something you've never stepped into before. Don't settle for your current experience as the limit of your life. Don't look around and go, well, I guess this is it. This is everything. Even if it's good, you're like, hey, I got a family, I got a nice house, my dog's nice, I got a nice car, like, hey, great. That's not the epitome of what God has for you. Like, we need to lean into the more. We need to live with an expectation that there is more than I could ask, think, or imagine. That statement alone means there's something outside of me greater that I have access to. There is something outside of you that you have access to that you don't even know exists. And what I feel prompted to do is to tell you that it's there and God wants to reveal it to you if you will lean in. One of my favorite stories of the Bible is in 2 Kings chapter 6. There's uh, the prophet Elisha and the scriptures I gave you for the story in Kings, ignore that, I've gone off my notes already. So we're good. Different story. So anyway, the prophet Elisha, he keeps getting words from God about what the opposing king wants to do. So every time the king makes a move, the king of Israel is like already two steps ahead of him. And he's like, he tells his people, which one of you is is telling this guy? And this dude's like, listen, there's a prophet. He knows what you do in your bedroom, man. Like, listen, you, you have no hope. And so the king, the king's like, well, let's go get this guy. Let's go get him. So they bring an army, all right? And so I'm going to pick this up. This is in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. And then also Elisha has a servant. So it says, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? Now imagine you wake up in the morning You're getting the crud out of your eyes. You got your coffee. You walk outside, and there is an army. Like, put yourself in a situation. We can read the Bible sometimes and glaze over. Like, oh, there was an army outside. No, there was an army outside. (laughs) And he's like, what are we going to do? I think that's an appropriate response. I think pretty much all of us would have that. Like, what are we going to do? And Elijah says... Don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. What? What does that mean? There's two of us, and we just woke up. And there's an army outside, and they're mad. They don't like us. They're mad. They've come to get us, and you're like, hey, it's cool, man. There's more with uh, with us than them. From this realm's perspective, from what you can see or perceive in any way, that's a lie. It's not true. That's like nice thinking. It's not, what are you talking about, dude? We're going to die. And Elisha's more with us than with them. And then it says, and Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There was a reality that they weren't tapping into, but it was nonetheless reality. 
I'm telling you by the word of the Lord, you have realities that you are not tapping into. There is more going on around your life. You have more with you than is with your enemies. And if you will have the Lord and seek the Lord, he will open up your eyes to see things that are above and beyond what you could ask, think, or imagine. That requires a drink. <laughs> so if that's truth, how can we settle for what we can only perceive? We are selling ourselves so short. And I feel that there is an invitation from God to lean into more. There's more for you. But it requires us to lean into him. He's the answer. You can't earn it. It's already there. It's already ours. It's just by being with him. It's from listening to him, from hearing him speak and lead and guide that all of a sudden our eyes are open and we're like, oh, we're going to win. That's awesome. It's amazing, two guys looked at the exact same situation and one saw an army and one saw, we're dead. It's good. Come on. How many times do we look at a situation and go, we're dead, when really you have a whole army around you Hallelujah. that we never tap into? I pray that something is stirring on the inside of you. There's more to this world than what we can see. And I think very often the church loses the spiritual sense of the church. We live in the natural. What can we do? What can we see? What can I think up when there's a whole spiritual world going on around us that we are smack dab in the middle of because we're in Christ and he's in us. Hallelujah. If we stop leaning on what we can see and start leaning on faith, we are going to see some stuff. So we're going to do something. Um, well, first of all, I want you to know that all of you can hear God's voice. God speaks. It's part of his nature. And those of us who are Christians who have given our lives to Jesus, he says, my sheep know my voice. He said it. So it's true. We may have to learn how to hear. We may have to perceive things a little more clearly, but nonetheless, God speaks. And he loves you enough to speak to you. But sometimes we're just unaware. So when he can speak through, like, you know, this is just basic teaching, but still, I wanna, I wanna encourage you, I'm gonna encourage myself. God speaks through so many ways. He speaks through scripture. Do you ever read a Bible verse that you've read a thousand times and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, like that is for me right now that it just takes on a whole new meaning. That's God speaking to you. It doesn't have to be this booming audible voice. Sometimes he does do that. I've had a couple times where I've heard something on the inside. I've never heard an outside audible voice, but on the inside it was like this. And I'm like, and then I did it and it worked. I'm like, hey, yeah, that's amazing. Um, he, sp <laughs> he speaks through people. Like I said, I have friends. I, had a bu I have a buddy. We were on the phone the other day, and I got off the phone, and God had spoken to me so much just through a conversation. He wasn't prophesying to me. He wasn't speaking to me. He was just telling me about his life and what God's doing, and I felt the Lord speaking on this and this, and I'm like, Oh, God, you're speaking. And that dude still doesn't know. I'm going to have to tell him on Monday. Like, hey, I mentioned you in my sermon. I mean, he can speak. You know, you listen to a sermon. Hopefully, sometimes my sermons, you hear something and you're like, that's the, that's the Lord for me. You know, that's why I love even just when you're clicking. If I, I'll catch like three minutes of a sermon from somebody, just hoping there'll be some little nugget where I'm like, it's exactly what I needed. Believe it or not, I get fed sometimes on Facebook. People say things like the quote about the warriors, that was on Facebook. I'm like, shoot, God's speaking to me through, this, through Facebook. 
Get off Facebook for the most part, but sometimes there's some glory on it, you know, whatever. Anyway, I'm telling you, God's speaking to you. And God speaking to you gives you insight into what you can't see. It says in Ephesians that we are saved by grace through faith, right? And one of, one of the first things I learned several years ago, was think about it. We're saved by grace, meaning Jesus died for us, he resurrected, he offers us forgiveness and new life by grace, right? It, it's, not, it's unearned. But it's through faith. The way you take a hold of this salvation is by faith. And the, th the thing is, you can't see salvation. It's invisible. It's not perceivable from my eyes, ears, or anything else. But faith says, hey, look, Jim, there's something with your name on it called salvation. And through faith, I go, I'll take that, and I pull it into this realm. I think that goes well beyond salvation. I think that goes to healing and breakthrough because you're like, Jesus, you paid for my healing even though my body's jacked up, but by faith, I'm gonna grab that thing and pull it in and I'm gonna see it. So I'm praying that you see by faith through the power of the Holy Spirit that there are things for you that you can't see, but they they're paid for by Jesus. They've got your name on it. They've got a bow on it. And he's waiting. Yes. Where his intention is for you to get it. And so as we get in the word and we listen to the word and we get around people that build our faith, our faith begins to see what is there and we begin to take a hold of it and pull it in. Does this make sense? Please tell me this makes sense. Good. So. I felt like the way we were gonna to end today was to actually do a little bit of prophecy because I think God wants to highlight a few people and speak into what's invisible that they're not seeing and then encourage the rest of you to lean into that thing. Does that make sense? Okay, so before I do that, it says in 1 Corinthians, I believe chapter 12, that the prophetic strengthens, encourages, and comforts. So if you get a word from God that makes you feel like God hates you and your life is over, it's not a prophetic word. Amen. There you go. Discernment 101. Okay. So that being said, I want to read this scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm really off my notes. I'm sorry, word person. But it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. We're actually supposed to take our prophetic words and fight with them. Because here's the thing. If stuff's invisible... You have an enemy to try to convince you that it's not really there or you're not really qualified for it. And so when you have a word from the Lord, you can stand in the midst of everything telling you the opposite and go, God spoke this promise. You were talking about promises earlier. I have a promise from God. I don't care what it looks like. My perception is not my final reality or my limitation. There is more for me than is against me and I'll stand until I see it come. So, Josh and Lexi are going to come up and help me. So, come on up. Another thing about the prophetic is they're coming up. I, we, the scriptures encourage you to test the word. When you get a word, oh, thank you. Can you hold that? Yeah. Thanks. When you get a word, take it to the Lord. Lord, this guy said, I'm going to be a pastor to the nations. What do you think about that? Do you, feel, do you feel confirmation? Does it confirm something that God's already spoken to you? Is it brand new and you're like, Lord, I lay this, I lay this. Like, is this you? Or what do you want me to do with it? Should I shelve it? Like, you, if you get a word, take it to Jesus and process it with him. Like, I was, I was joking earlier. Like, if someone comes up and goes, Josh Ruffner, you're called to Africa. Buy your ticket. Don't buy your ticket. 
Don't, don't do that yet. Go home and pray. Go home and, you know, process with Jesus. It's relational. We good? That, that is healthy prophetic ministry. You don't just take everything. You listen to the Lord. That makes sense? Yeah. Great, great, good. All right, so you have your people? Okay, good. I don't have mine. Would one of you like to go first? Lady, of course. You want to go first? I'll go first. Okay. All right. Um, so I want to preface mine by saying that I feel like the Lord speaks to me. Bucci was talking about different ways the Lord speaks. Um, and he speaks to me in a way that he gives me an image, and it really makes no sense at first glance. And then I kind of have to pursue it and be like, Lord, what in the world are you talking about? So I feel like I got a Lord for this man right here, third row, snazzy blazer, maroon shirt. Yes, you. All right. Um, so again, with this image, he gave me an image of like a, a younger boy, and I'm going to say like four or five years old, doing tie-dye right? Which there's a lot of people here with children. You can imagine I taught preschool. That's messy. And like in this idea, so I was like, Lord, what do you have to say with a young child doing tie dye? And he brought me to this process of, you know, it's the, the teacher or the adults, um, you know, job to get the perfect size shirt, to wash it, to twist it, to put all the rubber bands on, to then give to that boy so he can do exactly what he was supposed to do and, and like pour on all of these things, right? And when we do tie-dye, we don't necessarily know what it's going to look like. We just have to trust in that preparation. And I feel like for you, the Lord may be speaking into this, that this, either you're in a time or you may step into a time that looks messy, or it looks confusing, or maybe even like you thought it was supposed to be one way and it doesn't look like that, and it doesn't feel like that. And I feel like the Lord is really calling on you and saying to trust in the preparation that I have, I have supplied for you, that I have prepped you for this, that you are equipped for this because of what I've given you. And also like, there's a big revealing with tie-dye, right? And it's so fun, like it's joyous, right? And he says, even in this messy time when society and the world knows and he's, they're saying this is messy and confusing and, and wrong, that the Lord says there will be joy in it and that you will walk out that joy. And also this last part that like when you put tie-dye on something, right, it doesn't stay in that spot. When you deposit that ink, it bleeds into others. And I feel like the Lord is saying when you walk in this time or as you are walking, he's going to deposit things in you that aren't just meant to stay in you, that they're meant to bleed into the people around you, bleed into coworkers, into friends, into family, into people you don't know, into the atmosphere. And yeah, and that he is going to use you as a resource to show people the true source, which is Jesus Christ. So I bless that over you in Jesus' name. Talk about being inspired by these people is, is fantastic. But Jim, you, you, the anointing on your life is actually like dangerous because now I want to run through a wall. So <laughs> nice. like... Pray about it all. Like, don't just go for it. Cause you made me want to move to Africa this morning, and now I feel like running through a wall. So, so I was praying when, when Jim asked me to kind of get a word, and I was looking around like, Lord, give me someone I don't know. But he highlighted Sammy, Sammy DeLacy, actually. Because while we were singing in worship, man, I, I felt this sense of, like, I want to just drop to my knees. That's how I feel like I'm being humbled, and I didn't. And then as I'm feeling that, she drops to her knees, and I just felt like, that's your girl. Because I feel like, you know, where the word says, if you humble yourself and pray, the Lord will heal you, hear you and heal your land. And I know a little bit about your, your story, about your past. And I know you've had a lot of opposition being a woman trying to walk in the kingdom principles. And so I just felt like the Lord this year, I prayed about my word and he said, be empowered. You are empowered. And I felt like he wanted to impart that to you as a woman that's kind of trailblazing the way for other women to walk in this gift that we all have is not for men, it's not for women. And I'm sorry if you feel indifferently about that. Go to Jesus about that one. But I feel like he's empowering you to be a standard for women who are coming up in the church, for women who have a desire to pursue the Lord or to bring his kingdom down and be his hands and feet. It starts with people like yourself. And so I just bless you in the name of Jesus that when opposition comes against you, that you would just reject that completely. Know who you are. And him, know, know who he is in you, that you are more than empowered and more than capable. And just keep on blazing that trail, girl. You're a blessing. All right. Cool. All right. So, no joke, I thought, early, when I was praying earlier, I thought, if there's a woman wearing white in the middle section, that's the lady. And ma'am, you're wearing white right there. So, oh, can you stand up? Would that be okay? 
Good. We just want to honor you. Yeah, so I feel, what's your name? Penny. Penny. Nice to meet you. I feel like there is such a purity on your life, Penny. And I feel that you're actually, you have a, do you have a backpack on or a purse or? No. Oh, it just looks like that. Okay, well, it looked like a backpack. And I felt like the Lord was saying, he's removing the things that have weighed you down and the worries of life and that that purity that has been fought against by discouragement or you're like, but that purity is actually going to bounce back and momentum you, that's not a word, but like give you momentum because you don't have those weights anymore. You're going to go at a speed. I think that this is a breakthrough year for you in your spiritual gifts, in the authority that you walk in, and that in even just the depth of your, your time with the Lord in worship and the word. Like I bless you to have encounters that are deep and more rich than anything you've ever had before. And so like I just release healing over the things that you've carried so they're not yours to carry any longer. The Lord has taken them off of you and you are free to run in the purity that you have because of the blood of Christ. Amen. Thank you, guys. Great, great. Give, can you give them a hand, please? Okay, so one last thing and we're gonna be done. Can you all stand up, please? Okay, so... How many of you got that, you know, that one word, you know, one word for 2022, for 2021, whatever? Can you just show me, like, give me a wave? You got a word. Okay. If you didn't, no problem. But I want to ask you, don't, you don't have to answer me, but I want you to think about how did you get that word? Like, how did you know that was your word? You, you prayed and you probably listened and something came across your mind or your thought or there was a picture and you felt something on you're like oh shoot that's my word you know it's not it wasn't hard i mean the majority of people here have done it and some of us have been doing it for years so it wasn't hard but guess what you prophesied over yourself you heard from jesus about yourself and you got a word and we don't think anything of it but there's weight on that and so what I want you to do is I want you to ask the Lord for a word for yourself. Not necessarily one word, but a statement. Like, you've got this, keep going. I'm with you, you have nothing to fear. Something that will encourage you, strengthen you, or comfort you. And then weigh it. Say, was that the Lord or should I keep leaning in? So go ahead. I'm going to give you a minute. Actually, worship team, if you could come up front. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to begin to pray. For the Lord to give you a word that you can fight with. And there's no rush, but as you get your word, I want you to begin to worship the Lord off of that word. If the Lord says, I've got you, keep going, begin to say, Jesus, I thank you that you've got me. I thank you that this isn't the end of the road. Lord, I worship you that your kindness and your strength and your spirit will see me to the end. Begin to worship over the word that your father has given you and fight with it.
and I want you to ask yourself, what does that word reveal about what's around you that you never saw before? What does your word reveal about the army that's surrounding you that you never even knew was there? 